why would we invest a huge amount of time and effort into seeking a marginal gain that one or two percent improvement in one particular area when we've got a massive glaring hole to plug somewhere else why not focus on the thing that's going to give you a 20 percent gain right i call these the brilliant basics Hi there, and welcome to the Ben Morton Leadership Podcast. It's the weekly show that brings you inspiring interviews with senior leaders and genuine subject matter experts, all designed to help you be the best leader you can possibly be. And the best part of it all, it's completely free. It's my gift to you. Today's episode marks the start of season nine and the 135th episode of the show. I say it all the time, but I can't quite believe we have done this many episodes. That being the case, and also because this year marks my 10th year in business, I thought I would start with a solo episode. And what I'm going to talk to you about is sharing some of my reflections from doing eight episodes of the podcast that are relevant to business in general, not just to podcasting. And also some of the reflections and insights I've picked up along the way through 10 years of running my own business. So let's dive straight in, folks. The first thing I wanted to share with you, or the first big insight, is that success comes slowly in most cases, or at least it comes steadily. In our super connected, inordinately fast paced, and frenetic world, It can be all too easy to compare ourselves or our businesses to the absolute best in class and then become frustrated by our seemingly slow lack of progress. The real danger here is that when we pick a comparator that is so far ahead of us, we forget all the work that has gone into that person or that organization getting to where they are. And we're comparing their position many years down the line to our starting position. And we just forget that journey that fills the gap. So I think there are two key lessons or learnings here to share with you. Number one is to pick our comparators carefully. If I just take me and this podcast as an example... If I were to compare my podcast statistics and downloads to Stephen Bartlett's diary of a CEO, for example, I'm going to pretty quickly get pretty demoralized. And that in turn is likely to cause me to give up and say, well, what's the point? I'm never going to compete with Stephen Bartlett. I'm never going to have a show that's as popular as his. So what's the point? Right. Well, the reality is that he is, for me right now, he is just too far ahead to be a useful comparator at the moment, right? That doesn't say I can't aspire to have a show that is as popular, that is getting as many downloads as him. But right now, that's not a useful comparator because, again, right now, I simply don't have the same finances, the same resources, and the same contacts as he does. And then the second key learning here is when we compare ourselves or our business to the absolute best in class in our sector, or maybe as a leader, we're comparing ourselves to some celebrity leader of some big brand that we know of, then Again, as per my earlier point, we only see their current success. We only see their current position. We only see where they are now and what they're doing at this moment in time. And we miss all of that journey. We miss the struggles that they experienced along the way and the mistakes and the hardship and all the wrestles they had to get where they are. It's a bit like the social media myth, right? So much of what we see on social media is either photoshopped or it's just the highlight reel of people's life. 
And we think that's the reality when it's not, right? Because there's the journey, there's the struggle, there's the effort that goes in to get in when they, where they are. So yes, by all means, chase these best-in-class businesses and individuals. But also remember, they've been on a journey and be prepared to put in the work and time to get to where they are, if indeed that's what you aspire to yourself. The second insight that I want to share with you based on eight seasons of this podcast and 10 years in business is that consistency compounds over time. Another way to put this really is that it's not what you do once in a while that makes a difference, but what you do consistently day in, day out. One of my favorite quotes of all time, again, it comes from Aristotle, which goes something like this. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. So a quick story to really bring this point to life and try and make it relevant and accessible to you. There's a guest that previously appeared on my podcast and linked to their business goals and, and ambitions at the time, they decided to start their own podcast. Now, one of the things I'm doing personally with my team at the minute is appearing on some other shows. It's I'm doing it to help me sort of spread my message and bring my mission to life of creating this world where everyone can go to work inspired to give their absolute best whilst going home to their loved ones at the end of the day, feeling as though they're recognized for what they do and appreciated for who they are. So that's why I'm trying to get on these other podcasts and appear on other shows. But when Susie and my team was talking to this particular person about appearing on their show, she said that she was stopping her own podcast because she'd done around about 12 episodes and it wasn't having any impact. Well, fair enough. We've all got choices that we might decide to make and that choice is totally hers to make. But really having done just 12 episodes, is that long enough to build any sort of momentum and really get a sense that it's going to work? Are we really suddenly going to have a runaway success in whatever area we're chasing success if we've only done 12 episodes or we've only tried 12 times, right? You see, consistency compounds over time. So this is really about sticking with things and continuing to show up even though we might feel that we're not making much progress or it feels difficult and hard and maybe we don't really want to, we've got to stick at it. We've got to stay in the game. And there's a lot of research that backs this up as well. I'm sure many of you listening will have read Jim Collins's fantastic book, Good to Great, which really charts and documents his research into why the top performing companies consistently outperform all of the others. Now, in that book, he talks about this analogy of a, of a flywheel. How you've just got to keep pushing the flywheel. Just keep giving it a shove. Keep putting a little bit more energy in. And over time, as you do that, the flywheel starts to build momentum. And then all of a sudden, one day, it's absolutely spinning. And the business is just doing really, really well. And you've got a huge amount of momentum. Now, in that research, he goes on to ask all of those companies about the, the tipping point or what was the one thing that they did that suddenly changed the game for them. And more often than not, the individuals in those organizations that Jim Collins and his research team spoke to couldn't put their finger on a single thing. Because there wasn't one. It wasn't one breakthrough idea, one stroke of genius that made all the difference. It was the consistency that they'd applied over time. They kept showing up, they kept doing the basics, and they stuck at it. So point number two, consistency compounds over time. The third insight I would love to share with you is this. Ditch the marginal gains. Yep, you heard me right. Ditch the marginal gains. 
which in some ways is hard for me to say because I love the concept of marginal gains or 1% improvements. I've spent years thinking about in it, thinking about it, studying it, talking to clients about it, trying to build it into my teams when I was wor- working in the, in the corporate world. And a lot has been written around marginal gains or 1% improvements over the past 20 years, really. And it was mostly popularized, I think, by some of the work that Sir Clive Woodward did with the England Rugby Union team in the build-up to the 2003 Rugby World Cup, and also by Sir Dave Brailsford and all of the work he did with GB Cycling and Sky Pro Cycling, which later became the Ineos Grenadiers. Now, I say ditch the marginal gains. Actually, if I move away from the from the headline here, I'd say ditch the marginal gains for now or hold off on the marginal gains until you've nailed the basics. And this is really the point here, right? Why would we invest a huge amount of time and effort into seeking a marginal gain that one or two percent improvement in one particular area when we've got a massive glaring hole to plug somewhere else? Why not focus on the thing that's going to give you a 20% gain, right? I call these the brilliant basics. I truly believe that we've got to nail the basics and do them brilliantly well before moving on to any sort of marginal gain. If we don't, it's just wasted effort. Many years ago, I did an extensive research project into high-performing teams, which led me to create something that I now call the peak performance formula, which is simply this. Basics done well, plus ruthless consistency, equals peak performance. That's it. And if you just note that ruthless consistency piece, That links back to my first point that I shared with you around the fact that consistency compounds and grows over time, just like compound interest, right? If you want to know more about that peak performance formula, I've got a simple toolkit that you can access via the link in the show notes that will tell you a little bit more and give you some ideas of how you can apply it to you as a leader and also to the team, function, department, or even business that you lead. The point here really is that so many teams get hung up on the marginal gains, the new, shiny, exciting things that might give a little bit of performance improvement, but they forget or neglect some of the basics. Or they might focus on some of the things that require a huge amount of investment, when there's other stuff that's potentially free that costs nothing or will take a minimal investment that's going to give a much bigger return on that investment. Again, as a podcaster, I could quite easily go out and spend £400 on a brand new microphone for the studio. I've spent a lot of time looking at them online because most of us podcasters get a bit geeky about the kit and the kit and the equipment that we use. But if I did, would you notice? Would it make a difference to you, the listener? Probably not. The mic I've got is a really good one that didn't cost an insignificant amount of money. So that's a marginal gain that's not really going to bring much of a return. Instead of buying that mic, I could focus on my skills as an interviewer. I could focus on dialing up my listening so I can even better respond to what my guests are saying. Or I could put the effort into choosing even better guests and being more selective about who I invite onto the show. So I will get that mic one day. I will invest in a new microphone, but not yet. I've still got a lot of basics to nail with ruthless consistency before I start thinking about those marginal gains and 1% improvements. 
The next insight to share with you isn't something that is new to me. It's not something that is uniquely mine, but it is one of those things that once again, we've probably heard many, many times before, but it takes a certain experience in our own life or business to really hear it deeply and act on it. And really, this is about the African proverb that I'm sure many of you have heard before, which goes like this. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So again, using this podcast as an example to bring this point to life for you. The podcast started in COVID when big blocks of empty space suddenly appeared in my diary. When I started, it was absolutely a step into the unknown, and that was an experiment. I'd give it a go. I'd see what happened. I really didn't have anything to lose. Because of that, because it was an experiment, I didn't want to invest a lot of capital or cash into it, and I wanted to move quickly. I wanted to get the podcast up and running and launched before my diary started filling back up with work and speaking engagements and and coaching, because I knew it would very quickly. So what that meant was I did everything myself. I wanted to go fast. So in this case, I went alone. I did it all. I did finding the guests. I did the research. I did the editing. I learned how to, to edit in GarageBand. I did all of the promotion, the whole shebang. It was a one man show all done by me. Then, with the passage of time, I decided, I realised it was a keeper. The podcast was a goer and it was going to be here to stay. So then my thinking shifted. I wanted it to be a long-term project. I wanted to go far with it. I wanted to see, over time, just how big this show could be. And I have a 10, 15, 20-year vision for what it could look like in the future. And I can't do that by myself because I want to go far and need to go together with other people. So I've had to start building the podcast team to help me. So gradually over time, I've built out that team where I've now got an editor like Fina does an amazing job editing these episodes. My PA is much more involved in it. Amanda does so much work now in helping to do all of the back office admin that just makes the show tick and makes my job so much easier. I've got Susie helping me with the promotion and the community engagement and all of the the follow-up. So really, so we really are building this team so we can achieve that 10, 15 and 20 year vision for the show. And on that point around building teams when you're starting a business or when you have a startup, There are lots of gurus out there who will give advice on when you should invest, when you should bring people in. And some of this advice is solid, some of it less solid, and some of it actually is is conflicting. Some people say, build it early, invest early, like bring people together early on in the journey. Other people will say, hey, don't invest too early, don't bring people in. Don't restrain yourself and tie up cash by having to to pay salaries and having the responsibility of paying other people's mortgages, right? Which is what we do when we run or own a business. Well, I think my take is probably somewhere in between those two. And again, this has been my experience from building out the podcast and running in my business. So I would say bring people on board just a little bit too soon. And it might sound like I'm, I'm hedging there and not committing either way, but actually bringing people in just before you're ready creates just enough positive tension, creates just enough motivation for you as the business leader or business owner to compel you to personally take the right committed action. It's a bit like a rubber band, really. If you take a rubber band and just chuck it on the table, there's no tension in it whatsoever. 
So that rubber band is effectively useless. It's serving no purpose. It's not doing anything in, in that state. If we get that rubber band and we stretch it as far as we possibly can, the sort of molecular structure of that band is going to start changing. You're going to start getting little cracks and tears because there's too much tension. And if you hold that tension for long enough, or if you apply just a little bit more, it's eventually going to snap. Whereas if we stretch that rubber band just a little bit, then it's the perfect tension, right? It allows that rubber band to neatly bind together the stack of papers. It can serve its purpose and do its job really well. That's why I say when you're building out a business, when you're starting a new project, bring people in just before you're really ready. So that is it for this episode, folks, in terms of the main content. But let me just share with you a few parish notices, as they sometimes say in the UK. Firstly, we have got some great episodes coming up for you in season nine of the show. We've got a medley episode where six chief execs and MDs are all sharing their top tips for effective delegation. We've got some fantastic thought leaders from one of the world's leading experts on listening. We've got a Stanford professor talking to you about how to be able to really think on your feet and speak calmly with credibility when you're suddenly put on the spot, be that in a big presentation or maybe at a wedding when you're asked to give an impromptu speech. And on top of that, we've got some fantastic MDs and CEOs of some well-known businesses around the world all come in to talk about their leadership journey and share their insights. So as always, I hope you've got massive value from this episode, and I know you're going to get huge value from what's to come. And that being the case, it, I would be extremely grateful if you could just take a couple of minutes to pause and then rate, review, and subscribe to the show. It really does make a huge difference and enables us to keep the show going and enable me and the team to achieve that 10, 15, and 20 year, year vision because we really are only getting started in my eyes and there is so much more that we can do and I want to do with this podcast to help you and everybody out there be the best leader that they can possibly be. Because as I've shared in so many previous episodes of the show, the job of a leader, I believe, is to support, develop and look after those that we've got the privilege and responsibility to lead so that they can deliver the results that we're accountable for. And every single person that we lead is the most important person in the world to somebody else. And what we do, what we say, how we act and behave as a leader doesn't just affect those that we lead Monday to Friday, nine to five. We have a huge impact on what they're like when they go home and that has an impact on their loved ones. So if you are getting value from this, please share it with your friends, your colleagues on your social media to help me bring my mission to life where we're creating this world where everyone can go to work, inspired to give their best whilst going home feeling that their contribution is recognized and they are appreciated for who they are. That is it for this episode. Until next time, look after yourself, look after those you've got the responsibility and privilege to lead. And until then, lead on. <laughs>